Half a century ago, Neil and Buzz claimed the moon for all humanity. These guys landed in a spaceship so flimsy you could poke a hole in the hull with your finger. So to honour these mad bastards and Michael Collins who stayed in orbit around the moon, here are my top moon movies made before Apollo 11. By the way, if you don't believe that people went to the moon, please write a comment and tell me exactly when your mother dropped you on the head when you were a baby. So let's get started. You have to start out with the iconic Ur movie of lunar exploration. Georges Méliès was the father of all fantastic cinema. You can never give this guy too much credit for creating science fiction movies before the term science fiction was even coined. His 1902 adaptation of various works by Jules Verne and H.G. Wells isn't true to the original text and it's probably the least scientifically accurate science fiction movie in history. But it does what it set out to do. It entertains the audience. We get comical astronomers dressed up like Albus Dumbledore and top-hatted astronauts were played by Meliers and his theatrical cronies. The scantily clad ground crew were chorus girls from the Theatre du Châtelet. And the insectile selenites on the moon were played by acrobats from the Follies Bergère. Meliers did pay his performers really well and he even threw in a meal for them so they loved doing these movies with him. His theatrical origins show in the flyway sets and the multiple layers of foreground and background scenery but for some reason this movie really works. The single angle shooting was necessitated by the heavy equipment. They couldn't move the camera around. You also get some tadpoles substituting for sharks when the capsule splash lands back on Earth, which is really cute. And this movie is iconic. If you love science fiction cinema, you have to love the works of Georges Méliès. In the late 1920s cinema, Fritz Lang was the man. In a seven-year period, he basically created two genres, the spy movie with Dr. Mabuse, the gambler, and spies, and he took science fiction movies to a new level with Metropolis and Frau im Mond, co-written with his then-wife Thea von Harbu. Lang created a science fiction movie that took the idea of travel to the moon seriously. He consulted with Hermit Oberth, a genuine rocket scientist, to try to make the movie as scientifically accurate as possible. Oberth later worked at Pienamunda, developing ways of blowing holes in England from a distance. The story is really elaborate. An entrepreneur called Helios is friends with Professor Manfeld, who has figured out that the moon has a lot of gold on it. They develop a plan to go to the moon, which is stolen by a group of evil businessmen who blackmail Helios and Manfred into helping them send a rocket to the moon and back. Helios's assistant, Windegger, is engaged to Frida, whom Helios also loves, along with a stowaway kid, because there's always a stowaway kid. The ensemble fly to the moon and find the gold. The rest you can discover for yourself, but Frau im Mond, like Metropolis, is an admirable, superbly designed and evokes speculation about the future. You even get some zero-g drinking. Metropolis gets a lot of love as an important science fiction milestone, and it is. But so is Frau im Mond. The 1930s and 40s weren't big for space movies. People were busy dodging Hermit Oberth's V-2 missiles, building nuclear weapons from scratch and saving Private Ryan. The sole exception to this was things to come, but that's only kind of a side issue to the main thrust of that movie's plot. That brings us to the 1950s and two movies co-written by this guy, Robert Anson Heinlein. Heinlein was a swinging dick of science fiction writers in the 40s and 50s. In the 60s and 70s, he wrote long rambling novels about sex and incest, so the less said about that, the better. But in the 40s and 50s, he was the big guy on the block. This movie was produced by one of the great science fiction filmmakers, of the middle of the 20th century, a Hungarian emigre called George Pal. In Destination Moon, American business decides to build a moon rocket because if they didn't, the communists would. Only American industry can do this job. To convince the businessmen, someone had to make a Woody Woodpecker cartoon to explain physics to them, 
because none of them had ever seen fireworks on the 4th of July. After some hassles, the rocket gets built, launched and lands on the moon, where the astronauts discover they don't have enough fuel to get back unless they jettison a lot of their equipment, continuing that human tendency to dump rubbish pretty much everywhere we go. They figure out a clever way to get that achieved, and they head home. Of all the moon movies I talk about, this one is the biggest sausage party, apart from Grace Stafford. She's pretty much the only woman of any interest in the movie. Grace Stafford was the voice of Woody Woodpecker. On the plus side of this film, the production design is great, and the movie does have that lovely space art by Chesley Bonestall, who was the best astronomical artist of his age. Destination Moon is an atom punk space travel movie. It speaks to the paranoid nationalistic culture of Cold War America. They don't go to the moon for the adventure or for the advancement of human knowledge. They do it because of a conflict of political ideology, which is kind of what happened in real life. But in the real Apollo program, It was the spin-offs that changed the world. Velcro, Teflon, electronic miniaturization, weather satellite, and Buzz Aldrin punching out a guy who told him he didn't go to the moon. And Destination Moon gives us that cherry on the top of the ice cream of any science fiction movie in the 1950s. The uncertain end card. This much smaller movie, filmed in 10 days with sets left over from Catwomen on the Moon, continues the Cold War paranoia of Destination Moon, but it dials it up to 11. In the future year of 1970, evil communists replace a scientist with an evil communist duplicate of the scientist, and his job is to prank a spaceship into the American space station orbiting above the Earth. Colonel Bright Eyes, played by Donna Martell, and Major Bill Moore, played by Ross Ford, wrestle control of the ship from the fake scientist, and in order not to die, Bright Eyes makes an emergency landing on the moon. But before all that happens, you get this wonderful piece of pre-Me Too sexual politics from the General, played by Hayden Rourke from My Dream of a Genie, and Colonel Bright Eyes, who's never given a first name. Any more got that of you, and I'll turn you over my knee and spank you. If you do, I'll shout the whole place down. When the spaceship lands on the moon, the evil communist doppelganger has a change of heart, and he helps the crew fix a problem with the radio, which conveniently ends in his death. The movie's future is pretty prudish about two astronauts of different genders being stuck on a moon base together while they wait for a rescue mission. So they get married by, well, kind of space Skype, before being congratulated by the US president, who is a woman. This movie's a combination of WTF and campy silliness. It is worth checking out, and at 63 minutes, it won't take you very long to do that. The movie's actually a sequel to another movie called The Mouse That Roared. And in the film, the smallest microstate in Europe, the Duchy of Grand Fenwick, discovers that its local wine is the perfect rocket fuel. So they decide to send a low-cost, low-tech rocket to the moon at roughly the same time that the USA and the Russians do. The Duchy gets there first. This one satirises the same Cold War rhetoric the Destination Moon and Project Moonbase celebrated. It's silly fun and you can't take it at all seriously. When I first saw this movie when I was a kid, I loved it, and I love it now. With a modern day frame story, this adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel about a goofy scientist played by Lionel Jeffries, who invents an anti-gravity material, Cavorite, and travels to the moon with Edward Judd and Martha Heyer in a sphere made of eye beams and train buffers, is a fun and ambitious adventure. Professor Cavour and his friends find the underground empire of the insectile selenites, who pose not only a threat to the travellers, but potentially the human race as well. This is really grand old school adventure science fiction. A steampunk classic with special effects by the legendary Ray Harryhausen. It has that one thing that we always look for in any movie we see, rewatchability. I also love the resolution of the frame story, which is a little bit corny, but somehow it just works. And it takes us back full circle to George Melies. There are a lot of other moon movies as well, bad ones. Missile to the Moon, where a couple of escaped convicts are convinced by a scientist to pilot his moonship. They find an underground empire full of beautiful women, because that's what happened in the 1950s in this kind of movie. Then there's Cat Women on the Moon, which is the same without the convicts. And then we got 12 to the Moon, which gave us an international expedition of 10 men and 2 women, led by King Clark, who played Stew Pot in South Pacific. 
Let's finish on one really cool film. A movie called Luna, which was made in the USSR. It runs a really lean 50 minutes, and the first half of it is a history of lunar exploration up to 1965. It's the second half that makes it pretty remarkable. The second half is speculation about future exploration and colonisation of the moon. Like many of the Russian Fantastica films, this one looks really great. Using animation and live action, it gives us a Soviet future and shows us how the whole lunar colony is built from initial exploration to habitation by families. It definitely doesn't shy away from the science and the engineering. It tries to make it as realistic as possible. It blurs the lines between documentary and science fiction in a way that American and British filmmakers never did. Disney's 1955 Man in Space was close, but Luna isn't dumbed down the way the Mouse Factory's version of it is. It's a boldly aspirational film and somewhat reminiscent of the 1962 Russian science fiction movie Planet of Burr, particularly in the production design. People have dreamed of travelling to the moon ever since we realised it was a place. 50 years ago that dream was realised and the world celebrated the biggest adventure in human history. I really hope I live long enough to see people leave footprints on the brittle, crunchy regolith once again. I don't mind if they're astronauts, cosmonauts or taikonauts. I don't care if they're from Russia, China, Japan or America. I don't have a dog in that fight. But I do want to see this adventure continue. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and leave a comment telling me your favourite moon movies, even the ones made after Apollo 11. I'll be back in a week with another video. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and enjoy some good films.